A lot of people calling into the channel ask me what are the best and safest places to live in Kansas City. Now being a realtor and having to abide by fair housing laws, I have to be very careful in giving my own opinion as to directing people to or away from places. However, what I like to do to help you answer those questions is to share my platform with people who have probably a lot more experience than I do. In this case, I'm talking to Shane, who has been a Kansas City bus driver and explored probably way more of the Metro than I have. He has some really fascinating stories, and if you watch until the end, he actually tells of a story when he was attacked on the bus by a passenger. You're gonna wanna watch this whole thing. So I'm here with Shane, and Shane has agreed to be on the channel, and Shane has a lot of uh, stories about Kansas City that I think you would find helpful, especially if you're relocating here. So Shane, why don't you tell us about yourself, uh, you know, your family and how long you've been here? Well, uh, my name is Shane Carter. I'm a bus operator for the city of Kansas City, Ride KC. I started having my kids back in 2016. Uh -huh. They're seven, six, and four now. They go to really good schools and they're really good kids. We're active in our, in our church. So you work for Ride KC or you still yep. currently work for Ride KC, yep. right? What did you do there? Uh, I'm a bus operator. Um, right now I'm on short-term disability. Uh, because of attack uh, of an attack that I suffered that caused me to have to have some surgery on my pilot uh, on my pilonidal cyst on my tailbone. When I was attacked on the bus, it caused that cyst to rupture, and it, it caused me to have to have surgery sooner than I was anticipating. I've driven for the bus for about three years. Before that, uh, I was an EMT for a year, and before that, I worked for the state of Missouri Department of Transportation. All pretty public jobs, and what I can say. Uh, working in and around all of the Kansas City metro and surrounding areas areas is that this is a great place to be and compared to Atlanta compared to Jacksonville compared to any other metropolitan area Kansas City is the number one place to be as far as where you would like to live how close you are to things I mean you can get in your car anywhere you anywhere whether it's Gladstone or Liberty or out here and down in South Kansas City you can get in your car and be anywhere in 30 minutes yeah yeah. So, so, I mean, it's a, it's a great place to be, and, and with that being said, there's always going to be bad stuff that happens everywhere. I mean, there's, there's, there's terrible things that happen all over the place, mm. and, and there's nothing that you can do about it other than pray if you, pray if you believe in God and stick close with your family. Uh, when you did all those jobs, the EMT, all of that stuff, was that all in Kansas City? Yes. So you saw basically the entirety of the city. You saw the... You know, I'm sure there's a violent crime. Yes. You saw all of that stuff. So start at the beginning when you're an EMT and you're going around the city, how would you say to somebody who's relocating here, wanting to move here, how would you say, what's the best way to identify a safe location, an area where their family is going to be safe, an area where they're going to have, how, how would you say, just seeing the whole metro, how would you, how would you advise somebody? Honestly, I can give you better advice from the bus operating experience as, okay. far, as far as the uh, good and the bad. Because when I was an EMT, I had to stop doing that profession. I, I was only there for a year and it just wasn't for my mental capacity. I wasn't as, and I, I can say this now because I had a little bit of pride uh, back when I left that I can say now that it wasn't healthy for my mind and for my body and coming home. Uh, seeing my family after something traumatic like that, so I just figured it wasn't the best in the long run for me. Now, as far as being a bus operator, as much as it pains me to say it, anywhere in the whole city, whether you're going up north through North Oak Traffic Way or down Broadway or any of those places, wherever that there's a bus stop or wherever that the bus goes, there's going to be crime in that area and people loitering and homeless and, and drug abuse, no matter what part of the city you're in. Now, it gets exaggerated the f you know the closer you get to city center. Okay. But the buses are like veins, and the people, are li the people that we transport are like the blood getting the different arteries of the city. Some of those people have cancerous intentions, and others are like the white blood cells trying to do a good thing, like go to work or go to the store or something. But... We don't get a lot of commuters on the bus here in recent years that are trying to make a better life for themselves. Since COVID, the bus has been filled with people trying to use it as a free hotel. And mm. it, it only gets exaggerated. I, I don't want to get too much into the politics of it, but there's an agreement um, between Frank White, uh, our CEO and chairman uh, of my company, 
Mayor Quentin Lucas and the powers that be with Greyhound that uh, Kansas City is now becoming a sanctuary city and I'll, like I said I'll stay out of the po politics of it but being a bus driver I get to watch all of the people from di different parts of the world and country get bussed in here via Greyhound. Okay. So Greyhound is coming from all different parts of the, uh, of the USA dropping these people off no ID with, with no form of anything and they're expected to just be here now. Hmm. If you're looking to move to Kansas City, give us a call, 816-4-MOVE-KC. We help people relocate here all the time, and we love to provide helpful information for people who are moving to Kansas City on this channel. 816-4-MOVE-KC. Remember, watch until the very end, and we're gonna hear the story of when Shane got attacked by one of his passengers. That's contributing massively to the homeless crisis, the drug epidemic uh, affecting city center and northeast, and it's now reaching out as far as Belton, you know? So mm. I have the pleasure and the, the pain of also seeing the good and the bad of Kansas City, and, and I'm not immune to it either. You know, I have my days that I don't feel like going to work. I have my days where I, I, I don't feel like dealing with the public, and mm. you know, that's, that's my burden to carry, and that's between me and God, but I know to show up to work every day and to be helpful to people that I, like I'm supposed to be, I've got to have this up here right and this in here right. Mm, okay. What would you say is the hardest part about being a bus driver in Kansas City? Not even, not just the crime either. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm in between vehicles right now, but uh, back when I had a vehicle um, and I was going uh, to the job before my attack, I saw countless people and it would always happen yeah, right as the right as the bus was getting ready to close, about midnight or one o'clock at night, and there's always a family. No matter what bus I'm driving, there's always a family. There's always a lost person. There's always mother struggling with her two or three kids trying to get off the bus in the soaking rain. Whatever the circumstances are, mm. I mean it's terrible. So I always try to pull that last person aside or that last family aside. I always carry suckers and candy for the kids, like even though it's not Halloween, you know, because everybody only thinks it's normal to hand out candy on the bus on Halloween. They just give you a dirty look nowadays if you do it. But the only people that enjoy riding the bus and, and think that it's a really fun experience are the children. Right. And I know as an adult it sucks being trapped in a metal tube with a bunch of other people that you don't know because your financial situation isn't where it could be or whatever the case may be but those kids don't know any different different They're, they they see a big blue bus or, or with the kansas city logo on it or a big red bus and they're like oh this looks like fun let's get on here it breaks my heart seeing all the people fight in front of the kids it breaks my heart when people pull out their guns on the bus uh, it breaks my heart what the devil has done to people i mean we hate each other i mean we all hate each other and and even good people who claim to be good and do good, even they fall short of the glory of God. I mean, we we are a lost people without a leader. And until America puts Jesus at the forefront of everything instead of abortion care or this person's rights or why this person's not having a good day or whatever the political case may be, until God, through his son Jesus Christ, is at the forefront of America's business, we're, we're only headed further downhill. Mm. That doesn't take away from the fact that Kansas City is beautiful. Yeah. Kansas, Kansas City is a beautiful city. The people here are amazing people. Like I said, there's crime that's always going to happen. You're never going to be able to get rid of crime. Until Jesus comes back, there's, there's never going to there's never gonna be no crime. True. There's never going to yeah. be no sin. What people can do is to mentally and spiritually prepare for that. We're called to be lights shining in the dark places. And there's no other, even it, it, it can be sunny outside, but there's no other dark place than driving through some of the worst areas in the Kansas City Metro, dealing with what some, what, what some society members would call the most deplorable people. Mm. And there was a time, not perfect, there was a time that I thought the same way. I thought the same way until the Lord put it on my heart that he put his hands on a leper and back back in Jesus' time if you put your hands on somebody with leprosy that made you unclean mm. you know and all i am is a tool uh, i'm a tool for god's work and that's what i have to remember because if i don't i'll get on that bus and i'll cuss somebody out right. if, if if i get angered and that's not right that's not right i mean I'm, I'm there to be a light in the dark so that people can can come and ask the bus driver for help 
I, I, I've seen people run up to the door of the bus with their spouse, male or male and female, beating on them, and they're using the bus as a sanctuary. That's why you see the little house emoji uh, on the side of the bus. It's a safe place. So if you're coming there to seek refuge, it is now our responsibility to make sure that you're taken care of until the proper authorities can come and dispatch with whatever situation you're dealing with. No, I, I was going to ask, like, that is an interesting aspect of public transportation here that I didn't know about. So with the sanctuary being, like, the bus being a sanctuary, mm -hmm. and you said people kind of use the bus as a, as almost an encampment yeah. where they sleep or where they, where they stay. Um, so the bus only runs until, you said, 1 o'clock. Right. Yeah. And is that all over the metro? Uh, different routes shut down at different times, but there's a sweet spot from about 1, 1.30 to 3.30 in the morning that and the buses are, are done. And then do they all start at the same time as well? No, they filter out. Uh, so it's kind of staggered about just like seven, the About seven, eight minute intervals just to all the different routes. Okay. And then is there a central hub? Yes. That, where, where do they all go? Uh, when they 17th, 17th and Forest. Uh, our work is down off 17th and Forest. Uh, you'll see it. It's a gigantic warehouse with three or four hundred buses, mm -hmm. and it's right down off of 22nd Street. So if somebody, if somebody didn't have a place to go, and they were on the bus, and the bus was headed back to the main depot, yep. what is the procedure then? So there's a layover area before you turn into the um, entrance. You're supposed to stop. Uh, park and nail your bus and then do a complete thorough walk up and down your bus make sure that there's nobody there nobody there and, and nothing dangerous there we're supposed to call our FBI li liaison if there's any unattended bags that look suspicious or anything like that because at the end of the day it's a public entity so right. they have to be on the lookout for that stuff but 99.9% .9 of the time it's just people who are trying to stay on the bus or people who have fallen asleep whether that's because they're tired drunk or on drugs um, and we'll get in trouble if we bring them back. So once we cross that threshold, we will get in trouble and suspend it if somebody that's not working for the ATA is brought onto the property. So we have to rouse them. If they're unrousable, we have to call our supervisors and Titan to come and remove them from the bus. And then we go uh, do our post-trip inspection and shut down for the night. Mm. Okay. So when you said that when you said that Kansas City is a beautiful place, you know we've talked about a lot of the negatives mm -hmm. with the bus. You seeing so much of Kansas City, or all of Kansas City, what would you say is the best aspect of Kansas City? Traffic. I, I, don't, I, don't, mean, I don't mean to be boring. Um, I've been a driver, and like I said, uh, before Ride KC, I, I work for the state, and I've mm -hmm. been called out of state to do state jobs to assist with disaster relief and stuff like that uh, and in other parts of the world, well, the United States. So with that being said, traffic. I mean... Our longest, our longest rush hour is an hour, an hour and a half. If there's a bad accident or something, people take, uh, uh, people take advantage of the fact that you can't get anywhere. I mean, you can have the fastest car in the world, but if, but if the, you can only go as fast as the other car in front of you is going, and that's something I, because it gets me home to my family quicker. It gets me to where I, I need to be going quicker, and 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 the good thing about uh, Kansas City is that. Gladstone, Liberty, Claycomo, I mean, all of the areas surrounding the metro are so spaced out that there's room to breathe. And that's not like that with every area, but there's room to breathe around the metro so people can filter in and out of the city without it being a jammed parking lot. People can drive here from St. Joseph, Missouri, or Kearney, Missouri, or out south here from Belton, and they can all get to the city at the same time because everything's not so packed in yet like New York or Atlanta but it, but it's a great place and the scenery is beautiful I mean if you if you get right up here I mean right up here to there's a park uh, over near Washington on the I believe west side of Kansas City downtown there's a cliff overlooking into Wyandotte County and it's just one of the most beautiful scenes that because the sun sets in the west, so I mean, you see the sunset over there, and that's just one thing, and there's a bunch of things here that don't cost money to do, but you can pay money and go have a good time at any one. You can go pay and walk around a Science City or, mm -hmm. or with your kids. There's a bunch of things uh, to do here for kids, and there's a bunch of things to do here if you don't have a single dollar in your pocket, you know? So it's a great place to be. Just be cautious 
look for the little blue signs, the circular blue signs. As a bus employee, I love my I love my job and I love the people that I work with. I have a great boss. Sh shout out to Donald Bolin. He's, he's my boss. People that I get to work around are awesome. Public that I get to work around, I can tell that they want to be awesome. And there's some awesome riders. They just get drowned out by the voices of those select many now that try to take advantage of the system. Mm. And, 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 it's, and it's very heartbreaking. But... Look out for those blue signs. Anywhere the bus goes, there unfortunately is trouble, and you never know. It's, it's, it's like shooting dice or playing Monopoly or something. You never know which one of those blue signs is, is, is going to be a bad spot because we drop these people off all over, and there's a bus stop all throughout the metro about a block apiece. A block apiece, there's a, there's a bus stop. So if you're planning on moving here, I would stay away from the main roads as far as Paseo, Prospect, Benton Boulevard, Indiana, any, Troost, Truman, anything near downtown I, I, would I would steer clear from. One place I can really recommend is, is Lee Summit. Really underrated, I mean. But the bus, is it just Casey proper? Does it go into Lee Summit or no? Or is that a different tr yes. transportation okay. so system? The, five, the 570, we have a 550 bus route that goes to Lee Summit and then we have a 570 bus route that goes all the way out to uh, Blue Springs. Okay. So, but those are the only routes they only so come twice a day. So even different municipalities, they have mm -hmm. the, the ride KC goes into those. All right. Uh, On the Kansas side at all, or? Kansas, uh, yes. Uh, so the Kansas routes that we're responsible for mainly exclusively run into Wyandotte County. We used to run it all. Uh, it was all a part of one entity back even before I started working there. So I Even Johnson? Go. Yeah. Okay. All of that, all because they all look the same, you yeah. know what I mean? So, yeah. But you wouldn't be able to tell unless you've worked or have some knowledge about it that they're two different entities. They have a headquarters out in Overland Park, and we have our headquarters down off 17th and Forest. Some split happened before I, I started working there that caused the division. They take over most Kansas routes, and we take over most Missouri, most Missouri and some Kansas routes. Oh, that's interesting. I would. I wonder how that's divided. I'm sure I could find it, but I wonder how that's divided with the, the one thing taxes that I, and who pays for it and all that stuff. Well, as far as my job goes, I have to pay, of course, federal, uh, Missouri State and Kansas State taxes because oh, okay. they know every minute that my bus because they're all GPS monitored, so they know every minute that I pass the Missouri and the Kansas border, so they uh, they can pull it out for you and tell you exactly how many minutes and seconds I've been in Kansas this year for the job. Fascinating. Yeah. That's cool. So you said the best part is the people that you get to work with, the public. Uh, we'll get a little bit into the attack if you're comfortable talking about that in a little bit, but what would you say is, are you hopeful for the, the future sure. in Kansas City with the people? I know that you shared that there's a lot of negative things, there's a lot of uh, crime that the bus brings around, but do you also see things changing? Do you see things staying the same for the time being? How do you prognosticate the future? For the future, if nothing changes, then nothing will ever change. Sure. So even if it's just a small change starting out, it can have a ripple effect for the good and for the bad. And we're all hoping that it's for the good. I see plenty of potential. They're building, I mean, they're building all new railways uh, for our streetcar. Yep. I mean, which is another entity. That's of Ride operated Casey. by Ride Casey, right? Another, not, another. Our same, uh, our same Ride Casey. We own that. We just have different workers that do that, but we're all the same union. So you don't, you don't cross over to that at all? If I wanted to, I could. Oh, okay. So you said they're building that out, and then you're talking about the future. The future of Kansas City is based in whole on ourselves and how we treat each other. Um, that's what it all boils down to um, because we're only as good as we are to our neighbor. And if you don't have the heart to be kind when somebody's not kind to you, then you can only expect a bad outcome for whatever for whatever reason that it is that, that person's upset. What I mean by that is I have a choice every single day that I choose to go drive that bus and make whatever amount of money I'm gonna make for that day. How Shane is going to react to a situation and how Shane is going to handle himself, good or bad. Where I see Kansas City in, in the next five to ten years is if if we keep allowing the stuff that we're allowing to happen, things will only get worse as far as homelessness, as far as the drug epidemic, as far as you having to wait on hold for five minutes because your next door neighbor just got shot. I mean, it is just as terrible as any other city out there and has just the same problems that any other city does, just not on a big of a scale yet. Now, 
if you were in Atlanta or something, you would wait 20 minutes to even be answered and an hour for an officer to show up, but their per capita is much bigger than Kansas City's. I think that there's room, a bunch of room for positivity, a bunch of room for growth. I can see it as, as the construction's going on. Uh, they just finished the, the new soccer stadium, I believe, down over near the river. I mean, they're, they're definitely expanding and expanding and expanding and building. But if you don't build your people up, all the stuff that you're making is going to be for nothing. It's going to end up shuttered because, one, nobody has any money to go to these events. Two, everybody's scared to venture to other parts of the city because of the homelessness, because of the drug epidemic, because of the gang violence. And what I've noticed about the gang violence here in the city is it's not black and white anymore. It's not red and blue. It's, it's not anything. People are so lost. They put their morals to the side in every situation, whether it's for, for a hit of crack or for a bowl of macaroni. You know, mm -hmm. and, and with people who are so willing to throw away their morals and to throw away what they know is right, no matter how you are raised. If I mean... If, I could spend all day on the podcast or on the interview talking about how terrible I had it growing up. But if you let that define you, I mean, you can't expect for you to become anything else. I, I can tell you about the racism that I experienced growing up here. Mm. It's hard being the only white kid in a predominantly black area off of Prospect and Benton. I mean, it was hard growing up around there when I was a kid, but I knew what it was, and I got I got used to things, and I saw people for what was really behind that, you know, and I'm, I'm so thankful more than anything that I have Jesus in my life, and at the end of the day, I know where I'm going, so it doesn't matter how I act here as far as if people do something wrong to you, if people put their hands on you, if people put a gun in your face, if people try to stab you, no matter the case, you always have a choice on how you respond. Mm. You always have a choice. And you're allowed to defend yourself, and I would never, ever, ever discourage anybody from defending themselves. But if you're going to live here in Kansas City, at the very minimum, you need pepper spray. And even, even if you're not a physical person, even if you don't like violence, violence finds people who look like they don't like violence. And put more light into that, I don't want to be stereotypical, but if you're a woman and you're walking around in a nice dress and a purse and you're you just got off the bus in a not so good area the shady people around that area are going to be more prone to putting their hands on you and doing something to you for the five dollars that you have in your purse versus you getting off the bus and sweatpants and a hoodie keeping a low profile and keeping your head down now nobody should have to do that but if you're in a position that you have to ride the bus, or if you're in a position where you want to ride the bus just to see it, don't don't make any decisions without thinking about it first. Because there's always a set of eyes watching you, no matter what part of the city you're in, whether that's our scout cameras watching for the public safety, whether that's the all eight cameras that are inside and outside of our bus. There's cameras all over the city, but at the end of the day, a camera's not gonna be able to tell your family we're sorry that you're not here anymore. You have to be careful, but also take that with a grain of salt and know that people aren't looking for interactions, violent or, or otherwise, with people. We're all just hurting. We all do things on spur of the moment, and we just don't know when that moment may come. So you want to always be prepared, even with with its uh, with pepper spray or, or a gun. Kansas City is a beautiful area, and out of all the places that I've had the uh, privilege to go to, Kansas City has been my favorite by far. So let's talk a little bit about the attack. Sure. How how long did it? How long ago did it happen? Can you tell us the circumstances surrounding it, and, and just fill us in on what happened? Can't remember which day, but I know it was mid January. I could run inside and get you the paperwork on it if I needed to. But no, um, no worries. About mid January. I was doing the 12 and 35 route, which runs from downtown to 31st and Van Brunt, and then from 31st and Van Brunt all the way out to 47th and Main uh, in Westport. I had just dropped, it was brutally cold that day, and I had just dropped off a few passengers at the bus stop uh, before the corner of 12th and Bent at that China Feast right there. Now, I had pulled up to the intersection to a red light, which we get those a lot, and I noticed a guy carrying a bag and a big parka-style jacket running down the hill trying to catch the bus. I'm, I'm already knowing what it is he's trying to do. And the rules say that if you're not at a bus stop, it now becomes my problem if I want to pick you up. 
So if I was to pick somebody up and not at a bus stop and they were to trip getting on the bus and then they wanted to sue the bus, that's unfortunately now the operator's fault. Wow. Because they weren't at an approved stop. Okay. So it puts us in a great conundrum on whether we can bend the rules a little bit to help that person. But either way, he came, the, bu- the light was still red, it was safe to pick him up. So I nailed the bus and I opened the door and let him get on. And the second that he got on, he started using profanity. Because a lot of a lot of the people treat the bus operators like they're always trying to leave them. And and unfortunately, there's some of the operators that are. They're not really trying to pick up anybody. They've been doing the job so long that they don't want to pick up anybody anymore. Everybody's rude. Everybody's mean. And everybody handles that hurt and that pain differently. So I let him on the bus and he automatically assumed I was trying to leave him even though that, like I said, we were at the intersection at a red light. I mean, I, unless I wanted to break the law, I can't really leave anybody. So I said, I told him, sir, I need you to watch your language. I, I, I know that it's cold outside and I know that you're frustrated. I tried to level with him, but I, I need you to watch the language. There's children on the bus. I, I, I need you to get your act together so that we can continue to proceed down the road. He's not having any of it. Long story short, he comes to the front of the bus, threatens my life, which is, you know, goes in one ear and out the other. I mean, I, I get my life threatened uh, while I'm working at least once a day. And if I don't, you know, I, I almost think I had a bad day because nothing normal happened. You know <laughs> okay. what I mean? So so he comes to the front of the bus. I had just uh, stopped at a gas station before the start of my shift and got a big, nice 44-ounce drink. I told him if his behavior was going to continue to be this irate, I was going to have to ask him to leave the bus or leave the bus. He told me he wasn't having none of that. And he, he called me a bunch of racial expletives. We have a barrier uh, not not bulletproof by any means. I wish it was. It's but, like the uh, plexiglass. Yeah, stuff. it's just that real hard glass type substance, and then the steel door. So we've got that barrier to kind of pr- protect. Just if we're driving down the road, somebody just cold cocking us, you know. But the barrier is there as a deterrent more than it is to actually keep somebody out. So he started swinging his fists at me from around the barrier um, and he connected a few times to my forearm but once he couldn't really land a real great shot he picked up my 44 ounce drink and slammed it right in my face i opened the door slipped on my drink and i I had hurt myself and then he ran off of the bus and i I called it in they put an apb out on him they they they, you know did the whole nine yards of quarantine in the area and stuff because uh, assaulting a bus driver in in the completion of their duties is a felony and that's something that the state of Missouri, the city of Kansas City, and Ride KC take very, very seriously because we can't control how other people behave, act, and react, but it's, it's, it's a positive thing to know that if something does happen to one of us as drivers, there's always help around. I mean, we've got supervisors roaming the routes. We have our own private security team, Titan Security, and we've got the uh, police department and FBI as li- uh, liaisons. So. And we have two different two different police officers who are actually liaison from Kansas City Police Department that exclusively run our security. Like I said, it, it's a hell of a it's a hell of a deal to have to sit there and talk about any kind of experience, good or bad, especially if you're not skilled in the art of gab. But I was injured. I had already had an infected pilonidal cyst on my tailbone just from sitting down being a bus driver, sweat and, and ingrown hairs and stuff caused a cyst to form under your skin. I'm not a you know a complete medical professional so I won't get into that much, but the attack and the results of the attack on me caused my cyst to rupture and I, I needed to push up my surgery date. So I was out of work for about six weeks uh, going to, not physical therapy, but therapy just for the attack because the job, like something happens traumatic on the job, they like to get you taken care of as far as your mental health to make sure that that you're going to be capable of driving a bus. Mm. So you get that taken care of, um, and then I had my surgery, and, and that leads us to here yeah. where I'm waiting to go back. Did they apprehend that uh, person? His picture, and that's an unfortunate thing, his picture, pretty sure, is still on our wall inside of our main office. But when he got on the bus, he, he was face masked out. He was, he was dressed in two or three different coats. I mean, the only thing that you could know identifyingly about a person is their skin color because the mask isn't going to cover parts of the skin or there'll be breaches. So all I know is that he was a black male in his 30s or 40s. And that's all we will probably ever know. Mm. And that's okay. How did your family react to it? Well, it's not like being a police officer and I won't ever compare it to being a police officer because what a lot of them go through is, is stuff and medical professionals and nurses and everything, what they go through is something that I, I, I don't want to go through and that's why I quit. My family doesn't like the fact that I drive the bus, but I can realize that we don't have some of the best people working for us. And on the other hand, I can definitely realize that we don't have a public that cares 
about their employees. And that goes with police officers, that goes with firefighters, that goes with bus operators. Anybody in the public se in the public sector knows public does not give two tails about them. They only care about what they're getting for themselves, and that's the selfish selfish interest of the public. My family has tried to get me to leave the job, but it's hard to leave a job when you care about the people, even if they don't care about you. And, you know, I guess that's that's my own that's my own burden and, and my wife thankfully understands that if someone isn't there to help when help is needed, then that means that there's nobody there. And that means you could have missed your moment to be a good, useful tool for God. And just because necessarily you don't think that the situation that you're in is where you should be, it, it doesn't mean that that's not exactly where you're supposed to be. I mean, I saved a woman's life, and I saved two two gentlemen's lives. Um, and, I, and I don't want to say that I did because it was only the power of God working through me that that was even possible. But the story I will tell you is that I was driving the Truce Max down uh, Truce, and uh it was a completely different bus, a completely different route, but I had heard over the radio because my radio was in fallback, so I heard everybody's conversation. I heard of a bus up ahead of me that was having a medical emergency, and it looked like the male passenger uh, was either deceased or on the way to rapidly becoming deceased. So once I saw the bus, I, I, I pulled pulled over, put my bus in, uh, in park, kneeled it, and put the hazards on. I grabbed my go bag. My go bag is just, I, I carry uh, tourniquets, I carry Narcan, I, I carry all the stuff that could possibly be help, you know, suckers for the kids and stuff like that I was talking about. You know, I carry all the stuff that I may need or somebody on the bus may need if, if there's a good event or a catastrophic event. I get on my co-worker's bus, I see a guy crumpled and he's ashy and blue, not responding and no pulse. So I pull him off of his seat, I see his lips going gray and I see the foam around his mouth. I could tell he was going hypoxic, not enough air getting into his blood. And um, so I, I, at this particular moment in time, I didn't have any Narcan. And that's why I'm going to call it a miracle of God, because I was two minutes into giving this gentleman CPR. His name's Justin. I call him Saturday Justin because the only two words had ever said to me was his first name was Justin and today was Saturday. And I never saw him again. But uh, I was giving this man CPR and I knew what I needed and God knew what I needed. And I just started hollering out. I was like, this man's dead if we don't get any Narcan. At that moment, I, I was talking to the people of the bus because I know that there's 14 different drug addicts on the bus at any given time and some of them may have some Narcan, some of them may not have some Narcan because it's free at the uh, at the health department. So nobody had any, but I was talking to my, my manager, my supervisor, and the director of transportation at my job that same day and there was a there was a lady dressed in white. I just want to tear up thinking about it. I mean, because you never think that you could be part of a miracle, and then the entire time that, even up to right now, you think that maybe I'm not remembering it quite right or something, you know? So you always get the, the pangs of guilt and like, well, maybe it didn't happen like that. Well, anyway, I'm screaming out for Narcan. This guy's dead on the floor of the bus. I mean, he's dead. And nobody's there with some Narcan, but a lady in white appeared at the front of the bus. Four cameras on the inside of the bus and four cameras on the outside of the bus. Nobody Nobody, I was going over it with all the all the heads. I mean, they had a celebration for me and everything, but I was going over it with my bosses and we were watching the footage. And out of nowhere, a lady in white just starts walking from up the street. You can see her in the distance. And she gets to the front of the bus and she hears what's going on, I guess, because there's not very good audio. So we're seeing the picture great, but the audio is not so much. But uh, they have a recount of everything that happened from eyewitnesses and, and myself. But the lady walked straight to the bus like it was her purpose to be there, pulled one dose of Narcan and an unsealed foil blister pack of Narcan out of, out of some pocket, reaches in and throws it down the aisle to this black gentleman that's helping me provide CPR and counting for me and stuff. At the time, I didn't realize this. So at the time, he just hands me the Narcan. I think some passenger did it and I'm grateful and I give him some Narcan, I continue with the CPR, ambulance gets there, and by that time he's he's breathing in, he's got some color back, his skin is flushed, the Lord performed a miracle. But it wasn't until after the police and after the ambulance had already arrived and taken him away and were getting our statement that nobody knew what I was talking about. Nobody knew where this lady was. Nobody knew where this lady had come from, where she went. I wish I would have gotten his name, but the, the black gentleman that was helping me, he said he only saw her the once, 
and he never saw her again. She was dressed in white. I mean, and if you're out there, I mean, thank you for the help if you're a real person. I'm fully convinced it was an act of God, and that was an angel sent to help Saturday, just, you know, and reassurance to those out there, because, I mean, at that time, like I said, dealing with the public, it has a toll that it takes on you, and I'm nowhere near perfect, man. I mean, I have my days where I don't want to do anything, you know, and those are the days that I need to draw closer to God so that he can show me what it is I need to do because somebody might really need some help that day and if I'm not in tip-top shape men mentally, I, I can't be of assistance. Just like if God wasn't at the forefront of my life, those three people that I've said, I saved I saved the one on Truce that I just told you about, I saved one down near Truman Medical Center, and I saved one over on Independence Avenue and Winter Road. So God has a plan, and just because 98% of the time Shane doesn't know what that plan is, I know that I'm where I'm supposed to be. And people are broken. People are living broken and shattered lives. And people, even if you have a roof over your head and a nice car, that doesn't mean that you can't still wander aimlessly looking for a peace that can only be given to you by God. You know, and until the city and until the United States and until the world figures that out, it doesn't matter what you build. It, it doesn't matter what people around you are doing and what you're going through. Nothing will ever change for the positive. And the only things that are positive is these interactions that you can have with people like me and you are having right now. All we come into the world with is ourselves and all we get to leave the world with is ourselves the only thing that we can bring with us is people that's all we can bring after we leave this world we can't bring that nice jewelry we can't bring that nice house and car the only thing that we can bring is our testimonies and our real world experiences of how we helped through God through his son Jesus Christ to minister to those who are sick and hurting and dying and, and the best place to do that is where all the sickness, the hurting, and death is. And that's anywhere that the bus goes, especially down in the metro area. You know, it, it's terrible, man. But it, it doesn't it doesn't take away from how great the city is either. I mean, the Jazz District down off of 18th Street, I mean, is, is wonderful. I mean, we've got a bunch, bunch, a bunch of, of nice things to do. I mean, there's this one old man, uh, Frederick, he gets on the bus. I like to say he's 120. Him and I have a rapport and, and we joke, but he brings me these little tiny tangerines. Every time I see, I don't get to see him every day because I'm a board operator and I take over the routes that people need to go on vacation, people called in sick, people got hurt. I do all of their work. So okay. my, my work changes a lot, but I see this man on just about every route that I go to. And I can't tell you how many times I've had a terrible day or I've been having a terrible day or a passenger interaction has just left me in a, in a yeah. bad mood with a, a horrible taste in my mouth that this guy brings me these little tangerines and you know he's an old man so he's got some teeth missing and stuff but I mean so do I so <laughs> so no judgment he brings me these tangerines he's got this big I mean no tooth grin I mean this dude is really the bee's knees I mean I've seen this man get on buses full of irate people and just be like How's everybody doing today? Anybody like a tan? I mean, because he just don't care. He's about spreading positivity. And, and until we as a people don't care about our self-image and don't care what people think of us, nothing's going to change. You can you can build a, you can build a city up, but I mean, if, if the city is not in working order, you get shootings at your parade. You get drug addicts that can't climb up the stairs. I mean, you get old ladies getting robbed at downtown banks for their social security checks on the first and the third of the month. I've seen it. And we're, we're all like little ants who are racing this race, running this race. To what purpose? We're burning ourselves out. And we need to learn to enjoy what we have, respect one another as people, and enjoy each other's company and, and the company of those around you because you and I may never see each other, or me and him down the road may never see each other again. So it's very important that you leave a lasting impression on whoever that you talk to. All right. Well, Shane, you've definitely left a lasting impression with your thoughts about Kansas City, and I think that's super helpful for anybody who's wanting to move here or even people who are living here. Just the insights of somebody who, who knows the Metro probably a lot better than any one of us will just because of your work. So thanks for what you do. I hope that you get back to it soon. And really, thanks for taking the time for doing this. Absolutely.